Hello everyone, Dr. Kofi here and welcome to my YouTube channel, Tutor Med. And by now you know that everything medicine is simplified here. We will discuss the third component of urinalysis today, which is urine microscopy. Kindly support the channel by liking the video, sharing it and then subscribing to our channel. Okay, let's begin. And so for urine microscopy, we look for three C's and one M. The first C is the cells in the urine sediment. And for the cells, we are interested in the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and then epithelial cells. The second C is cas. The third C we are looking for crystals in the urine sediment. And the M is microorganisms like bacteria, parasites, and so on. We will add a fifth parameter here, which is lipids, and it will feature only on this slide. And I would mention that lipids in urine may be found in conditions like nephrotic syndrome and lipid in urine is known as lipid urea. Very good. So on this slide, let's briefly look at how to get the specimen for microscopy. And so ideally, the microscopy should be done immediately after the patient voice and urine dipstick is done on the specimen. And so we draw out about 10 to 15 ml of urine and centrifuge that volume at 1,500 to 2,500 revolutions per minute in that centrifuge for 5 minutes. And this separates the sample into a supernatant which is the liquid component and a sediment which is the solid component. And then a quantity, a significant quantity of the supernatant is poured out leaving behind a sediment. Then the sediment is mixed back into solution and a single drop is pipetted onto a slide for the microscopy. For microscopy, we do not routinely stain the sample, but in special cases, staining may be done, especially when looking for eosinophils in the sample. And so now let's begin with the cells, the red blood cells. Normal urine usually contains no red blood cells, but can contain at most two red blood cells per high power field, especially after a strenuous exercise. Now the high power field here means that the lens used in examining the microscope magnifies its objects by 400 times. Hematuria may be gross or microscopic, and by definition, microscopic hematuria is the presence of at least two red blood cells per high power field in a span or centrifuged urine. Once red blood cells are seen, our job is to find out whether it is glomerular hematuria or a non-glomerular hematuria. Non-glomerular hematuria means that there is bleeding outside the glomerulus, so it could be from anywhere from the tubules through to the urethra. And here, what we will see is that, or what the lab technician will report is that the red blood cells will be isomorphic. It means it has the same shape and size as the red cells in the blood, the same biconcave shape. However, in non-glomerular hematuria, the red blood cells will show various abnormal shapes because they get damaged as they go through the glomerular membrane and they are described as dysmorphic red blood cells. And once we see dysmorphic red blood cells, they are almost always from the glomerulus, a glomerular hematuria. And so this diagram shows a few of the dysmorphic red blood cells the microbiologists may see under microscopy. And so the first, you may see that, or he might see, that some of the red blood cells are ring-shaped instead of being biconcave in nature. 
he might see target cells and then he might see acanthocytes, red blood cells with blebs. So all these are forms of dysmorphic red blood cells. And once they are present, as mentioned earlier, they represent glomerular hematuria. And then to mention a few of the causes, it could be from glomerulonephritis, which also has its causes. And then it can be because of a thin basement membrane disease. The third condition I want to mention is IgA nephropathy. So we will look at these conditions when we are doing nephrology, but just to mention them as causes of glomerular hematuria. All right, guys, please don't forget to like and share our video and subscribe to our channel. The next nature or type of cell we want to look at is the white blood cells. Remember, we have different types of white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes, macrophages. The entire spectrum of white blood cells can be seen on urine microscopy. However, neutrophils and eosinophils are the most clinically significant. Now, white blood cells less than 5 per high power field may be normal. And then once you have white blood cells more than 5 per high power field on microscopy, in a centrifuge urine, you have pyuria. And on that sample, if you did a urine culture and then it comes out negative, then that sample with white blood cell more than 5 per high power field without a positive urine culture gives you a sterile pyuria. Now it is important to note that urinary neutrophils commonly is associated with bacteriuria. Once you see neutrophils, then it's most likely you see bacteria on microscopy when you start examining the microorganisms, which is the M. Now, usually, WBC count of more than 30 per high power field is considered to be from an infectious process. Like we said earlier, routinely we do not stain the sediment during microscopy. However, to identify eosinophils in urine, which is eosinophil urea, we need to stain the sample with Wright or Hansel stain to identify the eosinophils. Eosinophils in urine traditionally denotes acute interstitial nephritis. However, it has been found that 64% of patients with biopsy-proven acute interstitial nephritis do not have eosinophils in urine, and so a negative eosinophil urea does not rule out a suspected acute interstitial nephritis. Again, if you have a patient with sterile pyuria, you should be considering other causes like interstitial nephritis, renal TB, and sometimes kidney stones. So next, we move to the epithelial cells. There are three types. These cells line the lumen of the renal tubules and then the urinary tract. And so the first one is the renal tubular cells. Like my, as the name suggests, it lines the proximal and distal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, and so on. Then the next group is transitional cells. Now in females, these cells line the pelvis through the ureter and to the base of the bladder and ends there. But in males, it is from the pelvis and the entire bladder and then even to the proximal part of the male urethra. Then the next group of cells, we have the squamous cells, flat cells. So they take over after the transitional cells have lined the base of the bladder in females they also line a part of the bladder called bladder trigon in females, then extends to the urethra and then the vagina. And in males, it continues in the distal urethra. And so now, this is a picture showing the urinary tract from the kidneys to the proximal urethra. In the kidneys, we have nephrons, and then these nephrons have renal tubules. So here, we have the renal tubular cells. And then from the pelvis to the base of the bladder in females, 
we have the transitional cells but remember in males the transitional cells go as far into the proximal urethra now this is the bladder and this line divides the bladder into its base and then its trigone let's look at that in detail and so this is the bladder trigone as labeled and then in females the trigone is lined by the squamous cell right from the trigone to the vagina as mentioned earlier and in males remember the distal urethra is a one lined by the squamous cells now of these three cells only the renal tubular cells are diagnostically important they indicate acute tubular necrosis now except when they are found in casts we'll look at casts in our next video except when they are found in casts they are very difficult to distinguish from transitional cells now routinely or most commonly it is the squamous cells which are commonly seen in the urine and when they are present they indicate contamination from genital secretions which is why it is important that the patient cleans the external urethral meatus and then gives us a midstream urine to avoid this level of contamination all right guys again please do not forget to like and share our video and then subscribe to our channel if you haven't now our take home summary we should remember that microscopy involves examining the cells, casts, crystals, and microorganisms. Although certain parameters can also be examined, including the presence of lipids and then spermatozoa. We should also remember that among the epithelial cells, we have renal tubular cells, transitional cells, and then squamous cells. And squamous cells are the epithelial cells which are commonly seen and when they are present they almost always indicate contamination from the genital tract secretions from the genital tract and then the diagnostic cells among the epithelial cells are the renal tubular cells thank you for watching and see you in our next video where we will talk about casts crystals and microorganisms bye Thank you.